In the name of God who loves us and calls us to respond, amen. Yesterday afternoon, my mother flew in from South Carolina to spend the week with us. Hi, Mom. As summer comes to a close and as my daughter gets ready to head back to Pennsylvania for the school year where she lives with her mom, I was tired from a very busy week and decided to take the easy route and just call it in. We're going to do a pizza night. Now, my plan was to go and charge my car while I ordered the pizza and it was being prepared, so then I could pick it up on my way home. Simple, right? Well, I'm convinced one definition of heaven is where all the different toppings and crusts and sauces and cuts that you learn about whenever the question is asked, what do you want on your pizza? could somehow magically form into this one pizza, thin crust, thick crust, pesto sauce, tomato sauce, toppings galore, that could just come out of the oven at once, right? But no, there's always a negotiation. We haven't yet managed to do that on earth as it is in heaven. So anyways, it being my mama and her coming into town, I decide, well, we'll go with the usual fare for the three of us because I know my daughter likes that. But then I try to surprise her with a fancier pizza from uh, trying to a fi- like, try to match her favorite toppings. So uh, pesto sauce, goat cheese, and then Chicago-style pizza. So I had it all planned out, right? except that my go-to fast charger had recently bit the dust. So I was charging in a new location. The Chicago-style pizzeria had quoted me one time, but then I arrived and it was going to take twice as long. And then the other pizza place where I was going to get our usual fare was back in the opposite direction, closer to the original charger. And all I can tell you is that somehow miraculously, when the blessing was said, at the table, we all ate pizza, and I still had enough miles to get here to church this morning. (laughs) Okay? Simple, right? Beloved, wandering, as I did last night, wandering happens to us most apparently in times of transition. So if you're a newcomer this morning, maybe you find yourself wandering your way through this worship service, trying to find your way with a group of people who seemingly already know theirs, noticing words and music, signs and symbols, connecting the ritual acts that are new for you. I'm with you. I've been at St. Mark's before, but I'm newly into this role and I'm remembering all of the things that over my lifetime, honestly, I'm still learning and growing and finding my way in. So if you are new, welcome and peace to you. Perhaps you are searching for something that all of us are trying to find, what Peter was trying to find in his suggestion up on the mountain, a meaningful way to mark a profound experience of an encounter with the holy. For Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three dwellings. Let us stay here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. You see, it was deeply embedded in the culture of faithful Jews and the Hebrew people before them to set up a shrine or a place of remembrance where they had encountered the presence of the living God. Abraham did this four different times on his journey to Canaan. Moses does it following the escape from the Egyptians. And Elijah also builds an altar to God in the place where God triumphed over the prophets of Baal. So surely Peter was thinking along these lines, was thinking of marking this mountaintop as a place to remember. The story of the Transfiguration, which is the feast day we observe today, is also set within a time of transition. In Luke's Gospel, it's a a hinging point 
from the time of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, located up in the northern part of Palestine, where he was raised as a boy and where he first called the disciples, a hinging point from an itinerant ministry of healing and teaching to a ministry fixed with one destination. As this chapter will conclude, we hear Luke tell us that Jesus fixed his face on Jerusalem. You might call this a mid-gospel crisis in which questions emerge concerning Jesus' identity and purpose. A crisis which hits its climax for those around Jesus when he tells them that he will undergo great suffering and be killed and rise again. It's kind of like the shocking news we receive when we hear that a spouse finds out that he only has months to live. Or when our middle school BFF, Friends for Life, moves across the country because of a parent's promotion. It's the news of unemployment that unsettles the foundation for the life we were seeking to build and the kids' college tuition for their future. It is the retirement of a 28-plus year beloved rector and pastor. It is these unspeakable tragedies that strike us with a sudden shift, it seems, in the wind's direction. You see, for the disciples, just a few verses before, they had just now been sent out on their own to heal and to extend the ministry of Jesus. And just a short time later, their identity, their purpose, their Lord was to undergo this great tragedy. It was this news that they were to not tell anyone as if they were even ready to hear it themselves, as if any of us are ready to hear such news. So if wandering happens most apparently in times of transition, then Peter's comments about the dwellings comes right on cue. You see, Moses and Elijah talk with Jesus about, in the English, about his departure. But you may have heard from the other readings that word could be a different word. It could be about his exodus, which is probably what helped perk Peter up from his lull or his half-sleep state. Right? We remember that the exodus was the decisive moment of transition in the history of the people of Israel whose very identity was questioned as the generations after Joseph fell into slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. In the Exodus, the Israelites were decisively delivered out of bondage by the mighty outstretched arm of God, out of the bondage of slavery and captivity by God and led to freedom. And after being brought out of Egypt, the Israelites, we remember, complained so much that a whole generation would pass before entering the promised land. Peter's reference to making dwellings for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah was connected to the 40 years of wandering of the Israelites in the desert, where they would set up dwellings, temporary dwellings, or booths for their homes. So the Israelites, what Peter is referring to, are these encampments they would make, these dwellings. And they would camp in one place and stay there until, back to our transfiguration story, hint, hint, a pillar of cloud would show up and then tell them where next to go to set up again their dwellings. So in his comment on the mountain, Peter, half asleep, it says, not really even knowing what he's saying, was kind of wandering with his words by making reference to the wandering of the Israelites. Both of them experiencing a time of transition and both surrounding a question of identity. So, of course, all this comes back to land with us. We, too, are in a season of transition. Jesus, of course, has gone on to accomplish his departure, his exodus in Jerusalem. We are left in search of an identity, 
If not Jesus's, then our own. But God does not leave us to navigate or to negotiate this on our own. And no, this isn't the part of Scripture where God invented interim rectors. (laughs) But rather, if the disciples must leave this mountaintop experience, then God will go with them. Or perhaps, what is revealed on the Mount of the Transfiguration is that God has already been with them. Pastor and church historian Bruce Rigdon has led pilgrimages to the Holy Land for years and recalls coming across a manuscript from the 6th century written by a monk in which the monk suggested that the lost miracle in the story of the transfiguration is the miracle of the disciples. For they, on that day, saw God completely anew. Not simply in one room, in one place in Jerusalem, but with them, always. So, beloved, I can't promise any mountaintop transfigurations for us in this season of transition. Honestly, it's more likely the case that things like car chargers will break and pizzerias will take longer than expected to deliver our orders and, and that some of it will feel like it's in the opposite direction of where we thought we were going. But what I can promise is that if we're looking for a meaningful way to mark a profound experience of an encounter with the holy, like Peter, that when the clouds clear away and the voice has spoken, we will find Jesus. And we will follow him down the mountain like Peter and James and John and so many before as we seek to renew our identity and our purpose as his disciples here at St. Mark's. Amen.